My name is Amy Schof, and I'm a producer. I've been producing for a long time. Um, I'm originally from Florida, so I'm from a town where not many people made movies. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. You guys know where that is? Anybody? Um, so, yeah, that there was no film industry, basically. Um, I was, let's see, my, I call it my inciting incident was I saw Empire Strikes Back in the movie theater when I was really little. And I was sitting there watching it with my dad, and I said, whoa, what is that? Like, what is that world? And, like, that's when I decided I wanted to somehow be a part of that. I didn't know what that looked like, but um, I wanted to make those crazy worlds somehow. And so that's kind of what planted the seed of me wanting to make movies. And then I... Um, basically started taking film classes, watching movies, and then um, went to college, started taking film classes, and someone came, they came to me and said, hey, we're starting a film program, so I got really lucky and went to the film program. But, you know, going from there and going from actually making movies is kind of like a crazy leap, right? And you guys know that, because you don't have a huge film industry here, right? So, but I'm telling you this story because if you really, really want it, you can totally do it, and it's totally possible. So I decided, I visited New York City when I was 14 years old. Um, I had an aunt that lived there, so I went to visit, and I just fell in love with that city. Mind you, I had never been to California yet. <laughs> so I think I fell in love with New York just because it was big, and like anything was possible there. So I said, that's where I'm gonna move to. And so the second I graduated college, um, it was just a state school. And at the time, not a great film school. It's a good film school now. It's Florida State University. But, you know, it's just new. But I just took every film class I could possibly imagine. I was the only woman in my film class. Imagine that. Um, and uh, then I moved to New York City and just landed, knew nobody, and just got my butt on a film set and fell in love. Like, I was 22. I went to my first film set and just was like, what is this? This is so cool. And so I think, you know, all of you in this room obviously have that spark. You had that spark at some point where like, this is so cool and I want to create. So I just want to encourage you, no matter what your boundaries are, like you just get, keep getting on that set, whether you have to create it or you have to move to go find it or whatever. It's, it's really, it's such a cool business. So I've been doing it like 20, over 20 years now. And I started my production company young, age 25 and um, have made lots of movies, 37, 38 movies now at this point. And, um, and it's still really hard, it is. I have to tell you, raising money is really hard. No one gives me money. No one just says, you're cool, you've made 37 movies, here's money. I have to build it every time. <laughs> and I have to keep building the package, putting the script together, and making it good. So I just want to start with there, and then, I don't know, jump off point and we'll just keep going back and forth. We're gonna talk and I'm gonna ask questions from you guys because I wanna kind of get, you know, figure out what you guys wanna know from us. Um, I think you all know me. I met you in the last panel, Sarah Elizabeth Timmons. Um, and I do think it's interesting when you look at everybody that has been up here since this morning is you do have to start somewhere and none of us were born into the industry. I didn't go to film school. I didn't have a trust fund, like I had no money, no connections, and yet, you know, fast forward, and I've made several films with name talent, with international distribution. So, to your point, it is it is possible. So I hope that um, if there's one thing that you get today is that we want to give you the tools and answer your questions, so that you could sit there and say, well, this is where I am now. This is my project now but know what that you can aspire to and that you can attach specifically name talent to your projects. It is possible. Um, and that's really gonna be, I think, the subject matter that we're gonna dive into with this, um, this panel. So, talent. Yes. So, who in here has a script that you're currently working on? Okay, has anyone already made a film that has then already gone through the process of hiring actors? Has anyone hired um, an actor that we might know of or that has some recognition? Okay. okay, and has anybody attempted to reach out to someone that we would consider famous? Okay, just wanna get a lay of the land and see um, who we have in the room and what your experiences have been. So attaching name talent, I think, I don't know about you, but a question I always get is, okay, well, and let's, let's just talk, not just talk about name talent. I think that 
when you go to sell a film, which is obviously the end, it's important to start with the end in mind. I'm gonna eventually, after I make my film, after I cast it, have to go and sell it. And if we're gonna talk about just the reality in the industry, it is important to attach someone of some recognizability, whether that is an actor that you currently see on television or in film, maybe it's an influencer or somebody that has a huge following, like having, having someone that adds to the marketability of your project really is key. So while that, you know, I wanna encourage you to really keep that in mind, whether it's something that you do on this project now or your next one, but it really is a key piece of the puzzle is if you are gonna call and, and talk to a distributor or want to get your project in Amazon or Netflix, one of the first questions I get is who's in it? Always, and even before that, I mean, for me, I mean, for us, it's really tricky. Like, we almost have to attach that person before we even can make the movie. So when we're going to raise the money, we need these elements, and they're called packaging. Package these elements to actually be able to get the, the film made. Um, and so it is the chicken and egg, I like to call it, catch-22 of the film business everywhere in every country from what I've learned. Um, maybe a little easier in some countries, um, but in the States, it's everything is attaching those people. And the budget sort of slides depending on that. So if you're doing you know, smaller budget movie, micro budget movie, which I know a lot of you guys are, which is great, you don't need that absolute A-list talent in order to raise money because you can kind of put some money together, but you still really do want to attach somebody with some recognizability because it is such a cool time in filmmaking because I have been making movies for so long. Like I started making movies when like, you know, they'd have to go to the pay phone and put the quarters in and tell me where they were without the cell phones and on film, actual film, uh, celluloid. Um, and now everybody can just grab their phone. If you have a phone and a computer, you can pretty much make a movie, right? So that's awesome in, in most ways. And it's also makes sure it a lot more competitive, right? Because a lot, everyone's a filmmaker. So I think you have to be even more aware of making the best project possible, starting with the best script possible, and then attaching these elements that we're talking about. It makes it really important, because people want to know, okay, cool, you've got a great script. Who's in it? What's it about? But who's in it is the first question almost always. In the beginning, financing, and then at the end when you're trying to sell it. So how do you attach name talent, like, so it, you might assume that certain people are not reachable. But if you think about it, um, I go to Jim Carrey, right? He's known for comedy. And people are ca casting him, or were, back in the day, were for films because you could sell the box office like crazy as a comedian. Well, for a very long time, he had a hard time getting a role that was serious because that's just not what he did, that what he wasn't known for, and a studio was not gonna take a risk. And the one thing you have going for you is a lot of this, a lot of uh, the Hollywood uh, hierarchy, I think, it's a little fear-based, right? People's jobs are on the line, so they're not gonna take a chance to give an actor a role that's, that's not typically something that they do because people aren't necessarily gonna pay the money to watch Jim Carrey in a dramatic role. So where does that leave you? If you've got an independent film. It's a great place to be, right? Yeah. So you have this really dramatic role that Jim Carrey has never played in a million years, and maybe you've done your research and homework, and he likes the subject matter or is somehow involved in a subject matter in your project. That's gonna be something there you might have a slight chance of getting him. And so I always try to think outside the box. Even our movies where I can offer somebody I don't know, let's say half a million dollars or $250,000, that's obviously a lot of money, right? That's for all of us, that's a lot of money, but for them, it's not a lot of money. They're used to getting, you know, five million, ten million dollars even. But if it's a subject matter that they're interested in or have, you know, a connection with in some way, you do have a leg up over those other, you know, 50 scripts on the table, even if you're not offering them what they usually get. So I would encourage you, that's something that I do and something that you all can do. If you've got an interesting story, look to research, and what's so awesome about the internet is we can all be stalkers, right? We can all go and find out everyone's backstory, what they like, what they eat, what they wear. Instagram is amazing. Go follow those people that you are interested in being in your films. Now, be realistic. 
Brad Pitt's not going to come to your movie, your you know half a million dollar movie. He's not going to do my half a million dollar movie. He's not. But Christian Bale, you know, the top top tier people, they're just not because they're getting paid, you know, twenty million dollars to do the best movie they want to make. So they're not going to do it. Aim, be reasonable in what you're aiming for, but go and follow those people. Do your research. See what they like. Maybe they have a passion project. Maybe they have you know a subject that they're interested in. Maybe your script is about. I don't know, a homeless kid in, you know, that's 10 years old who's a musician. Maybe you go find that actor that maybe has adopted a, a daughter or son, or an actor who loves music, a certain type of music. I mean, there's, there's, the world is, is huge. So start being creative like that. And I think that's where you have these ends that you maybe don't even know about that's like, oh, cool. Yeah. And I do that now, like I'm doing one of my next movies is on foster care. And so I'm gonna go, my first thing I do is start looking at directors that maybe have adopted children or are fostering children because obviously you want to go to a subject matter. If you can't pay them in dollars, you can pay them in emotion, right? And so we all have that and that's kind of what drives this business other than money is the love of creativity and the love of like this makes me feel good. And a lot of people really do want to do things because it makes them feel good. And the other thing I will offer, I do, which is a big, big secret, and you guys all have it now, Offer actors producer credits. Everyone wants to be a producer. They really do. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so all of them, right? So almost always when I have big actors in my movies, you guys can go check out some of my movies, look at it. They have EP credits or producer credits. Doesn't mean they did anything but show up on that set and, and do the best performances ever. But, and then sometimes it means they did. It means they called their friend, the other famous actor, to come in and help and play a couple days as well. So it can mean all kinds of things. Very rarely does it mean they're gonna write a check. Never happened. I still feel hopeful it's one day that might happen. But, um, but it helps. And it's like getting that one person starting or that one person involved. Even if they say, maybe I'm not gonna be in your movie, I'm gonna come on as a producer or EP because I'm really passionate about your project. That's, that's what Brad Pitt did for Moonlight. Yeah. And that, I mean, that was still made for 1.5. Yeah, plan B. If you guys check out, so some of the biggest actors, they realize this early on. They realize their power. Just having their name involved gets something made. So a lot of them start their own production companies, and their name has got so much power. So they get behind these independent films that usually people would say no to, and because he's endorsed it or she's endorsed it, the movie gets made. And so I would definitely recommend that for you guys. If you've got a project that the script is really great, you feel really passionate, there's no reason why you can't reach out to someone um, to get them, ask for their involvement. Not necessarily to be in it as actors and leads because I don't know if they have time or whatever, but they can be involved as a producer. As a and champion. As you a know, champion. You need champions yeah. for your, your projects. We had um, a project that we're working on now which takes place in Kenya. And... Um, you know, I think you have to be realistic when you approach talent, but Denai, who was in Black Panther, um, I was reading the trades, which I would recommend that you all do on a regular basis, and you could find out the information that Amy was just talking about is... IMDb Pro. Who, who does IMDb Pro? Now, IMDb is cool, but if you can spend that extra, I think it's 13 bucks or whatever a month, Pro is the bomb, you guys. I, I get everything from this. You can do such a deep, deep dive on there, and you should be looking at that every day. Yeah, and but in reading the trades, which you can read online, or I think you on can just IMDb sign up Pro. for free, yeah. or in IMDb Pre, but then <laughs> IMDb yeah. I do Pro. I not work for IMDb Pro. <laughs> but um, I think that keeping reading the trades, that's where you're going to get the snippets of what actors are interested in, what they want to do. I mean, th somebody had a... Um, an interview, was it Will Smith, I think, uh, a friend was working on a project of a true story of a, a sports figure, and literally in an interview, Will Smith said, they said, if you could play anyone, who would you want to play? And he mentioned this figure, and she has a script about him. So while she might have thought that Will Smith was unattainable, all of a sudden she had a direct in to say, I read this article she knew that. in the variety. <laughs> And yeah. yeah, I was able to kind of, yeah, I had a reason to reach out and something that actually could be appealing. And it's the same thing with um, Denai. You know, she's A-list. She's like, I mean, we're still a low budget film, but she has an organization. The project deals with um, FGM, the female genital mutilation, and it takes place in Kenya. 
And um, she has a nonprofit that specifically empowers girls and deals with um, issues like that across the globe. So now we had a conversation starter um, and she would be a perfect person that would potentially take less uh, in pay to be a part of a project that already supports an organization that is close to her heart. So it really is about finding those connections beyond the money. And I'll tell you, I've, I know you've worked with celebrities. I've worked with Chris Cooper, Jane Seymour, Ellen Burstyn. Some of them demand, uh, you know, over a million dollars typically to do a role, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to do your film potentially if they care about it, and for a price that you would not even imagine. I'm not, we're not allowed to say it, because one of the beautiful things is as an independent filmmaker, if you are talking to an agent or start to get into that process, you can do what's called a no quote deal. And what that means, like after I worked with um, Chris Cooper, I got a call from Fox. And they called to check and see what he was paid on his last film, because of course that's gonna influence what they get, what they get paid, got paid on the next one. It's the reason a lot of actors don't want to do something too low budget, because then it just kind of takes their worth down. But if you do a no-quote deal, then it means that you're not obligated to tell anybody, you're not allowed to tell anybody what you paid them. So Fox called and said, you know, what was their pay? And I said, it was no-quote deal. So now you're protecting that actor if you've done a no-quote deal right. on your project that you're never going to disclose how much they got paid. Um, and you know something, another tool too, is there's a thing called favored nations on independent film. Yeah, I where, do this all the time. Where if you agree to, to hire someone and, and their agent says, well, you know, we can't, they're only gonna be a million dollars or they're only gonna be a quarter of a million dollars. And you're like, we don't have it, I'm sorry. They, this person is perfect for this project. The, the writer and director have had them in mind since the concept eight years ago. I mean, you gotta really like play to, their ego, and, and we really would love for them to do it and read the script. The script has won all these screenplay competitions and it had good coverage at, you know, William Morris. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, where was I going with that? Um, the no quote deal and the, help me. Favored Nations. Favored Nations, that's all we have to offer, but it's gonna be a Favored Nations deal so that no other actor on this film is gonna get paid more. Everyone's gonna be treated fairly. So there are tricks that, that you can use. Yeah, I do that all the time, that, that works, especially if you have an ensemble film. So if you've got one person in your in, uh, character that's absolutely the lead actor, you can offer them more than someone else, but the other characters that are you know lesser roles, um, you can do a favor nation deal where everyone gets paid the same. Or I, I do a lot of sort of ensemble films where there's multiple leads, which is tricky, and that's what that's really important. I've got one right now. Where there's like four main leads, and I cannot offer everyone the same amount. So I cast my big lead actor, who's a big famous person, and I'm paying him a decent amount and giving him a producer credit. And then because of that, he's different because he's a producer on the movie, and everyone else I can offer less money because they're not going to be producers on the movie. <laughs> um, and so, but with his name, he's helping get it made. And so that is something to think about. Um, if, if an actor or actress actually helps you make your movie, then they technically kind of are a producer in a way because they've, they're helping make your film. Yeah. Well, and as far as talent goes, I think we both can say it's, we're not just even talking about actors because um, we'll get to do some questions here shortly um, because we have a sports film and so um, that I mentioned earlier and we started, first of all, we Googled, because it deals with adoption, all of the NFL players that have been adopted or adopted. Did the research, and then that was a target list. And we thought, well, why don't we get a um, famous NFL player to come in and do a cameo in the film? Now, granted, it's a cameo, and it's a, which means it's a small role. Maybe they're just in like one scene or a couple scenes. But now, all of a sudden, you've attached somebody to your project that means something. Um, and it's important. And it could be, you know, an influencer. There's a lot of YouTube influencers, Instagram, Facebook, whether it's a, someone in fashion, someone in music. I mean, there's so many musicians now that want to get into film. They do. So yeah. why can't you be the first person, especially you, you read about it, they say, oh, I've always wanted to act. There's Olympians that have followings, like Lindsey Vaughn. In an article recently, she said that she, wa you know, she's looking to get into acting. Well, if you write that article and you've got a great role for her, I mean, be the first person that has something to actually offer. 
they have a name that can help elevate your film. Yeah. And it's just about thinking creatively about attaching people that can mean something. And meaning something means selling tickets, getting eyes, or you know, people that are going to help promote your film and that are going to get people to show up to watch it wherever that is. Whether it's that you've got it on YouTube, whether you you know distributing it through. Uh, Netflix, Amazon streaming. I mean, it's important. It is. And those people are a little bit more attainable to get to, honestly. I'm doing it right now with a, with a singer that was on America's Got Talent who had a, one of these huge... I saw it. It was on my Facebook feed like six months ago and she just blew me away. Here, here I am. I got a new project like three months ago and it's a young girl. She's supposed to be 10, 11 year old singer and and the, her character is just embodied this girl. And so I reached right out to her on Instagram. She got back to me. <laughs> I'm not, and like, and now I'm following through the proper channels. I'm going through Sony to talk to her. She literally just signed with Sony. I was like, damn, it was like a month ago. But, um, but you know, I'm going through the proper channels as well. But I did, I reached out to her. I was like, you're amazing. I'm reaching out to you about a movie. And she liked it. And so, um, you know, those kinds of things, it's interesting. You never know. If you kind of catch somebody right as they're taking off, I've been really lucky. I've cast some some really big stars, like Anthony Mackie. I cast him in his first role. Um, I worked with Zoe Saldana in her second movie. I worked with Kevin Hart on his first movie. We cast him, and um, you know, you catch somebody, and I got them because they were new. We saw that they were talented. They'd done one movie or two movies, and we saw, oh, these people are amazing. And then, you know, that helped our movies, obviously. Well, back to the trades, they actually usually publish like the top 10 actors to watch this year or follow the film festivals. Because yeah. a lot of us, you know, like Sundance and Cannes or South by Southwest, there are, you know, see what films that maybe had a no name that now has attention. Well, that's, that's the actor that now the William Morris, the CAA, the ICM, the UTA, all the big agencies are going to go after. You know, that yeah, you have to really that's like, the time. it's fun. It's a fun role. So look at it as like a challenge, but also something really cool. That's something I definitely do. Like I look at, if I'm looking for, so right now I'm casting way too many movies, but um, like I would say three movies I'm casting have younger leads, like teen girls, basically. All of them, which is odd, but cool. Um, and so I'm looking at the America Got Talent, these people. I'm looking at girls that, you know, maybe were Disney children that are coming up and now they're in their teenage years and they want to play like dramatic roles in an indie film where it's not, you know, super teen teen. Or you look at, um, like she said, look at the movies from the past year. I'd like to go look at like the best of Sundance, the best of South by Southwest from last year. I know you told me, um, Discovery, you had a film, like look at the last best of South by Southwest because you have a film that's coming up. Look at those film festivals that were the year prior Look to see who's winning, um, what some of the stories are, and the talent that were in those movies. Because if those movies won or made won an award, and one of those ki the kids or ki new new talent won an award, they're about to hit it. So you might be able to get them right on the ramp up. And so that's that's fun to recognize, you know, and um, and you get those people behind you, and then that creates that like layer of legitimacy, I like to call it. Even after me producing so many movies, if I work with a first-time director or second-time director, I still we still have to have that layer of legitimacy. Um, and what I usually do um, is hire a casting director early on. I like to have a casting director that's cast a lot of movies, so that's like a producer saying they're great, and it's a casting director saying they're great. So it's like a couple different layers. Um, for you guys also, I, t I would talk about co-productions, are awesome. I hardly ever, even on all my films, I have co-production partners and I can't recommend it enough. I know a lot of times when you're starting out, you sort of feel a little bit precious about your project or precious about your story. You don't want to share. You kind of want to, I can do this all on my own. I'm telling you, this business is the most collaborative process and you will find so much joy in finding others that have also the same inspiration, the same excitement about the project that you're doing together. So like in this room, how many people have a production company together? How many people were working together in this room? Hands? A few people working together? Awesome. Awesome. Great. So I, I would just, yeah, recommend that. Like instead of you guys having 10 different projects all trying to do together, 
combine forces. Like this half of the room, start a production company, this half, I mean, just because it really helps, it really does. Like in all my projects, I have at least two to three to four producing partners. It just, it takes an army. And you know, the less, I found out the less resources you have, the more army you need, right? <laughs> you just, you do, the lower the budget, the more hands you need. And so just embrace that, make it fun, and then you have support, and it just, you kind of find your strengths and weaknesses. Like my business partner and I, we've been partners for 20 years together, which is crazy. And like, so we really have our strengths and weaknesses. We have similar strengths. Like he'll, you know, produce a movie at the same time as I do. But there's certain things like, you know, you'll you'll go to talk to somebody and you'll kind of get a ch get a feeling of this person's personality. So I'll put him. I was like, oh, you'll get along with that person better, or I'll get along with this person better. And in this room, you might look to see, okay, our target list of X talent or the people we're going to go after are these five people. So you put, pull your resources together and you say, okay, who do you know? Let's think, let's look on all our Facebook pages, Instagram pages, our social networks. Who do we know? You may not know that person, but you may know that person. Or your uncle, or your cousin, or your friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend might know that person. Just gather your resources because it's like, it's just, don't never think anything's impossible. You somehow through this room, somebody will know that person that you're trying to get to or somebody that can possibly link to that person. And just don't be afraid of just bringing in partners. It doesn't matter. It's better to have 10 partners and get the thing made than, you know, no partners and you're just sitting here talking about it forever and ever and ever. <laughs> really. Because I that was a problem I had in the beginning. I had a hard time delegating. I'm like, no, I can do it better. We all think we can do it the best. And you probably can't. Like, really, it's probably going to be better if you get help. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and um, I'm curious what your experience has been, but, like, when it comes to actually attaching the talent. Um, I think keep in mind that we, money doesn't grow on trees, right? So let's say, well, there's a couple things. I want to talk about um, maybe throw out some figures that we've dealt with that we obviously can't name who we've hired, but let's get a budget range for approximately how much we can get some notable talent for that would, that would be applicable to everyone in the room. But two things I, I do want to mention is um, at cameos like you know you can offer to make your money go as far as you can let's say that you all of a sudden do have x amount of money that you can offer a talent and you're able to give that to a talent that you can condense your working schedule so that they only have to shoot like chris cooper like the movie was about jd salinger we shot him out in two days so I was able to offer him an amount for two days versus that same amount. Never would have hired him for three weeks if we need him for three weeks. So really right. build your budgets around, okay, if we can condense this character and pay an actor X amount for two days, it's going to look like a lot more than that same amount over the course of two weeks or three weeks. I think that's really key to keep in mind is, is build your schedule around the actor. Also look, I mean... Even now, I it's really hard to attach if my lead character is a twenty or thirty year old, like the typical like really hot Hollywood actor. They're all working. They're in demand. They're doing all Marvels and Avengers and all that stuff that I don't watch. But like I know they're busy and they're getting big bucks. But you know your older actors that were that really hot actor one day and now are up yesterday. in age. <laughs> yeah, I know. And yesterday. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah. You know, like if it, you know, Ellen Burstyn or Jane Seymour, they're all up over their 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're just not working as much because there aren't as many meaty roles. So the opportunity to either hire someone and help discover. Uh, you know, a, a, a budding actor that's younger or to hire someone that doesn't have a lot of roles. I mean, look at the diversity. Where there's a lot more films for um, diverse actors, but there was a point where there wasn't. So if you had a film, you know, it was easier to attach someone because they just, you just want to work. So um, those are two things I wanted to point out. And then, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about the money? And we have to, wait, to translate, someone help me with U.S., to your dollars, well, it's multiplied it. by seven. We can do that, we can talk about like. Do it in US, US. you guys are cool, okay. okay. You can do it like in relativity, so like just, um, I mean budgets, right? Don't we all hate doing budgets, but it's like we have to do budgets. So one of the first things I do, um, when I'm putting a movie together, so I get sent a script, and I'm like, this is amazing, let's do it. Um, you know, you kind of start thinking about the box. I call it the box, and how big is my box? And um, you obviously, 
for me, I'm kind of a like scrappy indie producer. Like from the beginning days, we were just like, let's make it for, is like, let's just make it. So let's figure out what's the lowest amount of money we can make this for. And that's kind of the approach of films. And sadly, it's not changed <laughs> because it's easier to raise less money than it is for more money sometimes. Um, so most of the time. So, you know, you build the box around what you can get. So when you're choosing your project or you're writing your screenplay, you think about those things, right? You're not going to write something where there's like underwater, you know, uh, robots chasing cars, whatever. Um, you're not going to, or you're not going to do like a million pyrotechnics, like you're not going to do crazy things that you know you can't pull off. So you're going to write something more like walk and talks, character pieces, things that, you know, you can do. Um, so in building that box, um, when you start thinking about what you're going to spend on your, on your talent, usually, so my rule of thumb, and it's pretty much the same for everyone, is the budget is there's above the line. Do you guys know what above the line and below the line is? Okay. So above the line is your, is your key creatives, basically. It's your writer, director, and your talent. Um, and that's about half of the budget, and the other half is below the line. And that's kind of the rule. I have found all the way through, whether you're doing it for five dollars and it's two fifty for above the line, two fifty for below, or you're doing it for you know five million dollars. It's it's pretty much the same. So out of that above the line portion, you've got some of that, you've got about twenty hmm, percent of that to writer director and really the rest to cast, right? So you've got you've got a pretty good chunk of money that's gonna go to your cast. And so you have to figure out of that, I aim high on cast. I just know in this business, even if I've only got $5 to offer somebody, I want to try to give them as much as that as possible because money does talk, right? So you try to allocate as, as much money as you can out of the cast line on them for your top lead person. You're not going to be able to pay everybody that amount, but you're going to have your top lead role and you're going to try to make your best foot forward. Because as you're raising money, I have found it's better to go go high, aim big, try to get that actor because then the money will help, it'll help bring the money. So that's that catch 22 of like, do you have the money to pay my actor? Yes is the answer. <laughs> and usually you don't have to, you don't have to send the money at that moment. You send the money before you're gonna shoot. And so you can always say yes, because that's what you're manifesting, right? You're manifesting that you're gonna find the money because this actor is gonna help you find the money or whoever you're trying to get. So on the money, you, you build your box. So if your budget is, say, let's use a lower amount. So you say you're making a $150,000 film, um, and you've allocated $75,000 for above the line. You've got, say, $40,000 to pay actors. Um, you want to figure out, um, well, there's, there's unions and things in America. Do you guys have SAG here? No. Um, so that's kind of cool in, in some ways, you know, you figure it out. Like there's, the, there's regulations where you have to pay people kind of the same as called scale. And then, but really the, the more famous people don't work for scale that often. I have paid big famous people scale because that's what I did across the board. So it's kind of like favorite nations. I own two or three of my films actually with some of the biggest stars I've worked with, like Winona Ryder, um, Peter Sarsgaard, Jim Gaffigan, um, John Leguizamo, uh, Kellen Lutz, like big actors. They worked for scale. <laughs> they did. And um, it's because everyone did. And um, it's unusual, but that particular director um, is friends with some of these folks, and they just really love these stories. And they're a lot of times they're biopics or they're science themed stories that you know are important about important people. And the thing is, again, it's about the subject. If you if someone feels passionate about the subject, it's not going to be about the money. Because really, for a lot of these folks an extra $100,000 or whatever doesn't make a difference. It's really about they're, they're excited to play, to be a part of something. So I would say go in with your best, best foot forward and see what happens and then offer them roles, um, offer them you know either producer or EP credits and that also inspires them. So it's not unheard of to offer someone $10,000 to come in and do one day, that's actually a lot for a one day shooter. For one day Two shoot, day. exactly. 50,000 for like an, an actor who's won an Academy Award, it's been done, absolutely. Absolutely, and so yeah, in scheduling, like you said, so I try to, like if they're the lead, of course, you, they're gonna be there for at least 
two weeks. I think I've gotten a lead out in two weeks, maybe wow. a, a week. That's impressive. Yeah, because <laughs> um, you can condense. You can be really creative. Um, but usually they're there for a longer period of time. Yeah. But if you have like a second or a third lead and you just condense their days and you're creative on the locations, you don't like have to take them across town. Like you build the set right next to the, the other and you just move them from set to set and you can get people in and out in a couple of days and their part looks much bigger. And you could say that the other co-star or the co-lead of the movie and you were able to get them out in a few days. So you could think about it if actors are really, really busy and they have scripts this high on their desk, but there's this story about this character that they love and they really would love to be a part of it, but they are only available for three days between this date and this date. I did this with the really famous actor. I'm not going to say who it is, but early, early on in my career, I met somebody on the street. Yes, I did it. I was a little bit of a stalker, um, and it worked. I don't recommend doing it always, but if there's an organic way to say hello to somebody, I'm serious. It's okay to do it if you're respectful. Don't like follow them and like get their number and stuff. But like, I went up to this famous actor. I did know a, his girlfriend, a friend of his girlfriend, so I did not randomly show up there, but I did kind of randomly show up there. And um, I went up to this person. I had gone to their agent that week, so they, they were aware of the project, but they weren't really paying attention. Which is key, um, though. Yeah, the, the, going to the agent. Go ahead, but yeah. yes, or go back to also doing it the right way. Yeah, so doing it the right way. So I did go to them and said, hey, I, I got this script to your agent, and that's how I approached the actor, and they I were like, oh, cool, walk with me. And I told them a little bit about the project, and we created a rapport. So I'm not saying that you do this all the time, but if you can do it in a, in a cool way, if there's an opportunity, and you're gonna also talk to the management at the same time, just saying. It's not, it's not impossible, and it's, and it, and it's kind of um, fun. You've do got not, nothing to lose. What? You've got nothing You've to got lose. You've got nothing to lose. What are they going to say? You know, they're going to ignore you or they're going to be like, oh, that's kind of cool. If, if you, it's, it's really about presenting your project and who you are. That's a, mostly why people do things. Sometimes it's for the money, but we're, nobody in this room really, they're, they're going to do their projects about the money because none of us are spending $20 million or whatever their quotes are. They're doing it because they like you or they like what you're, what's a, you're in your script. And so really think about that. Well, and, and I think it's important to note, too, script. The reason that anybody, that's the core. It all goes back to the script. An actor, you can get in the door, you can get them to read it. If the script doesn't speak to them, they're not going to do it. So do not t be patient. Make sure that your script is 100% the script that you want to present. Because if you do get in the door, you've got one shot. Yeah, That's it. I, and I have a track record of producing films, I mean, met someone, sent a script, we did a rewrite, I haven't even gotten that person to read the rewrite. Like, I had my one shot. So do not send a script if it is not ready, because when you do get in the door, you better have the script that's going to sell them, because you will not get, most likely, a second chance. And, so don't take it lightly. Exactly. And on that, and on... <laughs> Um, in, in addition to the scripts, you guys, I always build decks. You guys know what a deck is or a pitch pack, whatever you want to call it. We talked about it in the last okay. panel. Yeah. It's really important because, let's face it, not everyone likes to read scripts. Okay. Um, so if you have something shorter with pretty pictures, people love that. They like go, they quick, they like, oh, look at the pretty picture and look at um, the synopsis, which is short and easy to read. That's cool, okay, I might consider opening the script. Because sometimes if you don't have the pretty pictures or package next to it and they just see this big thick thing, it's really tough. Well, <laughs> and, and no money on it, why would I read it? You know what I mean? But if you've got this package and they read it and they're like, oh, I love this character. Oh wait, I heard about this person. Oh, whoa, I love the Caribbean. I want to go over there and shoot. I want to go take a vacation, get away from my family. So, like, you know, there's there's weird incentives. You just don't exactly know, but it's up to you guys to go find out. Go find out why somebody might want to do your project. And it's so cool because you can just really find out so much on the Internet now. You have so many more advantages than when I started. I didn't even know. You just have to, like, just throw it up in the air and just trust the agent's going to get it to them now. You really can, like, figure out who are these people. Go follow Will Smith. Like, I follow follow so many people on Instagram, you get to like see who they are and what they like. And so you kind of have a leg in that's really awesome to figure out what people might want to do. And maybe write scripts based on something that they like, right? 
Yes, then you know you've got an advantage. There was a question, um, and I just want to make sure that in the back that you just keep that question and we'll get to it. Did, is it, it oh, no. did you want to ask your question? Yeah, because I know it's probably pertinent to something we were just talking about. Um, it was just to clarify, if you, if you give the actor um, executive producer um, credit, sorry. If you give the, the actor executive producer credits, do, do they have a back end stake in the um, in Good the film? question. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. Okay, I just want to know. Yeah. If, you, if you're offering anything with a P, yeah, they're going to ask for that. <laughs> well, and that's actually, and that parlay is into two that y an actor up front, um, you might only have so much to offer, but that's where you can offer more in addition to the credit in the back end. And, you know, some people joke like, oh, well, we ne may never see back end money. But if you're keeping, if you're being really smart, and all the cash you do get is going towards talent and production value, right? Those are the two key things that are gonna be reflected on the screen. And then you get your food donated and you get your flights donated and you get everything else donated. So all, even though you're still a low budget film, it's all going to production value. Then you do have a better chance of making your money back than had you spent two or three times that budget. And then there's a better chance that they will see the back end. So there are, you know, other ways or deferred pay is something else you can offer them. So um, if you offer them deferred pay, it's paid a little bit um, sooner than if they actually had back end points. Do you guys know what is waterfall is? With the waterfall, it's a, it's what, how yeah. the money flows back into the movie at the end. So deferment is like top up on the waterfall. So that's like the first people that you're owed. Um, so when we talked, we, we went through Waterfall in the last one, and okay. it was um, give your investors their money back, then give them their 20%, and then 50-50 split in general, as an example. The deferred pay, and then the 50-50 split is normally where actors start seeing their money in a typical agreement. But if it's deferred pay, it would be before you start paying back your investors normally. So that's an advantage. So if the film only makes $10,000, $50,000, $100,000, well, they get that money. So... Um, yeah, but be like, I've learned this over the years, like to make your movie and to be able to like pay, it's so much more important to pay for a person that's going to help you get distribution than say, and I know this is tough to hear as a filmmaker, than maybe an extra day or two of shooting. I know, ouch, that's super tough to hear. But like, be smart. Like you might have to make a few creative sacrifices that feel like a huge sacrifice, but really, nobody else would know. They don't. They don't know that you, you know, uh, on the lat location. There's like the half the room's missing. Like no one knows because it's film magic. You know, you couldn't pay for the rest of the half the set or something. But like you know, just spend money wisely. And I always say that paying for talent is such a big, big, big important part. And like if you just pay for that one famous actor and everyone else gets scale great if you get that person it's just I've learned this over the years I mean honestly I, I'm still learning after all this time like I literally just started in the last year making big giant offers on people where I didn't have the money but I made that I, mean, I went ahead and like pulled out the big numbers and making offers and it's been working and then I get them and I'm like okay I'll be back to you. And like, and then you go and try to find the money. <laughs> and it's, um, Chris probably hates hearing this. Like, agents hate hearing this. Um, and I just lie. Amy, you got the money? Of course I got the money. And you know, and you don't. And like, then you, but you gotta we like go. To see, we like to see the financials. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we'll show you the money when we have it. <laughs> Well, before the do it, before the actors coming to set, of course you you're you do have to be careful about the credibility, right? Of not getting called off on it and then losing your credibility and losing that connection well, entirely. Well, exactly. I mean, you don't want to do it in all your movies, but once you've made a few, they okay. trust you, and then and then you. Yes. I will show you an escrow when I get it. That doesn't mean I'm gonna show it to you right away. So <laughs> it works. After you've made several films, she's blackballed now. All the agents now blackballed. If she calls you, one of my big see the bank account. actors, you know who it is. I'm texting it right out to everybody at my agency. All about you. They all know. <laughs> well, anyway, if you're going to spend that money too, I think that I, I cringe. I was I was consulting with the after they had already brought in their talent on a film, and I'm going to make this up so I don't disclose it, but like. They were, uh, we have talent. Yeah, we have somebody we're really, really excited. I'm like, well, who is it? And it was like, oh, it's Denzel's best friend's cousin's neighbor's sister's brother. And you're like, oh, if you're, if you're gonna spend the money on a talent 
really make sure it's someone that if you say their name, people know who they are. It's not Angelina Jolie's cousin or it's not so-and-so's brother because what do they mean? You know, they're attached to that person, but who are they? So just make sure it really is a legit. And you know what you can do? If you have, we were talking earlier about networking and um, using those connections. If you've gone, let's say you've made friends with somebody at a panel that's a distributor or you're at least keeping in touch with them and they said, oh, if there's ever anything I could do, let me know. Well, if you have some ideas of names of actors that you're interested in for your lead role, run it by a distributor or a sales agent or somebody that's in that world to see what that person really means. Because there's also people that we know their names and their household names, but the truth is they mean nothing for box office. Yeah, this is such they a mean big nothing point. for yeah. foreign sales. So you could think that you just spent like, you know, all of the money that took you eight years to raise on this person that really isn't getting you any further than had you like hired your neighbor. So make sure you do your research now that it's not just someone that's famous to you, but that it's actually someone that means something because the reason to attach them is because they will help do sales. That's a really big point. I've made that mistake so many times where I think, oh, this person's like gonna help me. And then you talk to your sales agent like after you're already in negotiating, you're like, oh my God, I just wasted this money. It's not waste. It's not like they're not gonna be an amazing actor. But again, you spend money on people that almost guarantee sales. Like their name means value. And I'll just tell you a little trick. Kind of like these names are always changing. Like I'm making my lists all the time and it's such a pain in the butt to know like who means what. But usually if they've had giant box office released films, at least three to five of them, um, then they're probably gonna be somewhat meaningful. So it's hard, it's hard to tell. And a lot of times, even now, people think TV stars, like really big TV stars, like new TV stars, like the the, the, the TV um, shows are just popular in the last couple of years. They're probably not going to help with the sales as you think they will. Now they will later, but if you're trying to get your movie financed right now, a lot of times those names are not going to help you necessarily. Um, More so in streaming, though. But theater, yeah. and you have to keep in mind, it's two different... Um, avenues is theatrically yeah. who could sell a box office like when we cast Jane Seymour in our first film we we cast everybody in that film because we wanted to go to Hallmark that was we were very specific about where we were going yeah. if our goal was to be theatrical first of all it would have been a different script exactly. but we wouldn't uh, this is being recorded but I mean we probably might not have cast Jane Seymour because she's much more of a TV Hallmark name than she would be theatrical so getting clear on where you want to go who your audience is is it streaming as a theatrical will also help you make those decisions that's but, yeah. absolutely true like if you are targeting I mean let's be real Netflix is almost impossible to get to these days like they're making their own projects with a lot of their people that have deals with them so that's that's a tough sell however like if you um have a, a tiny movie and you're casting the lead of the, the it's the lead in the top like one of the Stranger Things kids that's been you know the lead on Stranger Things for like I'm doing this on one of my movies right now so because I've got some kid stars in these movies well no kids really out there that are still kids are super famous except for these new TV people that are coming up and that's an, an awesome place to cast because that's that for for younger folks that's the place to do now if you've got an adult lead with those young actors that are say you know 40 plus then you go look for the people that have had the big box office films and combine them with that kid and that's great that's that's like you have to start putting on that kind of business hat of like what have they done in the past um, well and I keep going back to our football movie it's about kids so we don't have an opportunity to cast the leads but there's two supporting roles that are, are that's what we're going after in order to get somebody that's yeah. that's going to mean something and the transition though there's a lot of tv actors though that are dying to do film so if you have that opportunity for them that's another way to get you know uh, talent um and so the casting process and um i'm curious to see what you do what i normally do is i'm like i'm going to shoot for the stars just at least i at least have to say that i did so like we have like four tiers of casting like i have the list that's like okay, these are like the top, this is my Denzel, and um, like I'll just, I'll stay with Denzel for one of the ones that we're, we're looking at. Like he would be my, my wish list. Maybe I'll have three of those. We always try to go, okay, let's at least, let's at least go out and send it because you at least wanna say that you tried. And if you're going out to talent like that, first of all, um, you only wanna go out to one at a time 
because you're not auditioning them, you're, you're making them an offer. Uh, and agents talk too, so go one at a time, so you have to get an answer or a pass from one until you go to the other, and that's for the top tier. And then I have like the whole like, maybe they're hot TV names, or maybe they're like the B-list actors, and then we'll go to them next. And then there's like, you know, then the third tier of people that would still mean something, but you know, we, at least we know that we tried tier one and you tier two half. first. Yeah, yeah, you do pretty much cut your budget. But I always like yeah. make a list, keep them in tiers as to what they mean, shoot for the stars, depending on your timeline, you know, don't spend too much time there, but at least say that you did it because you never know. It, it is absolutely possible it's been done and then kind of work your way down uh, the, the lists. Yeah, I don't do that long of lists because usually, I don't know, I feel like for me, like the list is, I know I have two, t I have two tiers really. There's like the swing for the stars tier, but I'm still pretty strategic in the way that I've told you guys. Like I do my research of who might actually like this concept and like, and I'll do that because I'm not going to, it takes a while. The casting process is so long and it's super painful because like you do need to wait. Like you can't make an offer for one week. No one's going to ever read it. They're going to be like, yeah, right. Um, so you have to give them at least two and a half weeks. So if you've got your top wish list, I usually do my top wish list of like four to five people um, and I'll swing for those people first. So do the math on that. So like you're like a good three months in, right? Going for your top tier people and then every pass you're like, Ugh. <laughs> and then like then you're going to next and then to next and the next and you've got four or five and I just kind of you kind of keep doing that like yeah. even and then there comes a time where you got to sort of like for me I'm there with one or two movies right now where I'm like maybe this isn't going to work move on. And, or maybe <laughs> we're not going to make this movie or maybe we're going to make this movie at like half the budget level because I know that I'm not going to be able to sell it with the names that I have now and we're going to have to go back to the director and the writer and think like okay how can we make this less um, and so that's it's kind of a thing so you kind of get to that place um, and then really it's just I like to do the thing that I told you guys to do is like who do I know that might know somebody that knows that person yeah. so if I can come in on a couple different angles like the sneak attack and the offer at the same time so um, as much as you guys might be like you're living on an island over here and you know and not know a lot of people the social media is amazing and like you can still find ways to do that sneak attack and you just have to do it it's like there's no different me sitting in my apartment in venice really than here it's like because i don't know i don't know a lot of people either like and we we don't even know who we don't know so but you can just go and start out there and look for it and then like try to find that connection in some way and um i just encourage you to do that like it's kind of it's such a cool time to do that right now because of social media and and like what people can do in that way and the way you can engage with people um, and people maybe that might know somebody and um, if you've got a good story it really is about that story if you even want to try to engage with somebody and that's even with, with the projects we're doing like I'm not going to go after say Brad Pitt or whatever on somebody on a story that I know he's played like 10 times that's just not being yeah. smart you want to look and see okay wow maybe this guy or gal would consider it because they've never played this in a million years. Maybe even right now with like gender roles, maybe they want to play a man. Maybe they want to play a woman. I mean, like really, like, you know, Tilda Swinton does that. Like, you know, really awesome actors do that. Like maybe, like really think outside the box. Maybe they want to play a child. I mean, who knows? Like there's so many cool ways of approaching things that someone might find like whoa that's really weird that's interesting yeah I'll read that you know how to grab somebody's attention and I think in every budget level if we're talking you know five dollars to five million dollars like that's you should think about that well and you have to stand in your power too right yeah. think about it this way I think we get intimidated I do I'm like okay I have to call this agent oh, like, I or this it. person. I, like, I get agents. knots in my stomach. I have to take like four or five hours to convince myself to actually like dial. And sometimes I dial and hang up. Like it's bad. I have like extreme like Some agents anxiety are around. They're I mean, so mean. There's so many are <laughs> so hard. Like, I mean, really like I, I made a lot of freaking movies and I have to do the song and dance with the assistant. Like, oh, even now, I'm like, come on, really? You didn't see my last movie? But like, they do not give a shit. They don't care. That's their job is to block you. So the that lesson, their, <laughs> their lesson though, is to go in it with the attitude because and I still like, I'll fall into it and then I'll be like, yeah, you're worthy. You're enough. You've got this great project. But I have to like shift it to, I've got a project 
that they're going to love. Like I'm, what are you, it goes back to what we were talking about in the earlier panel. What do I have to offer them? I'm giving them an opportunity. No agent shows up to their job being like, oh my God, I'm going to get so annoyed by every single person that calls today. In the back of their mind, they're like, God, I hope that that Oscar winning scripts lands on my desk for my talent so that I can offer them the opportunity of their life. Like, so you could be that script and you have to go in knowing that in the back of someone's mind, like they want you to be brilliant. Well, they you want, want you to be the person that they said no to that becomes a really successful movie because that's really where the fear comes in. They don't want to be the person that said no to you when they they missed it, right? So you want to convince them. Like everyone that, that was a part of Ball Dallas, the Dallas Buyers Club. The yeah. number of people that are like, oh yeah, we yeah. passed on that one. Yeah. It's like, oh. No, I but, ha I. I have like one, like I had these very big filmmakers came to us with their first movie and I like, I could still kick myself every freaking day. I was like, I don't get it. I'll tell you what it was. The Puffy Chair, Russo Brothers. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh. Puffy Chair, what, what's that? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> so like I've had filmmakers come to me like, and now I'd like that. And there's a few others where I'm just like, yeah. I don't get it. And I was so busy. I had like a you know mailbox full of other pro people talking to me. And it's just like, you don't know. You just don't know. And like, that's the same with this, everyone that gets paid in this business. Like they don't want to be that person that like, like that said no or didn't get it. So you have to convince them why they have to pay attention. Yeah, stand in your power. And just, you practice. I do it, all. I still practice. And I'm like, I'm pitching something. I'm like, that sounds terrible. I gotta like work on that pitch. I'm like, <laughs> and you just, it's gotta be fun. It's gotta be a game. Like if you're choosing to do this for your career and hopefully you are, um, cause it's super cool and interesting and always changing. You have to really just believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing and I will piggyback on that. If you don't love the project you're doing, like really feel like, oh my God, I have to make this story, don't make it. Find something that you feel that fire because you can be pitching on the phone. If you're not feeling it in here, that person on the other end is not gonna feel it in there. And like, honestly, like you gotta really feel it. Like I'm sitting here, I can sit here and tell you about like 10 of my projects. I'll tell you maybe four of those projects, you're gonna feel that thing that I feel inside super excited. Some of the other ones are gonna be like, yeah, I want them to happen. I'm going to help them to happen because I like the person involved or I like something about it, but it's not my baby. I call them my babies. My babies are the ones that I'm going to like do whatever it freaking takes to get those babies out, you know? And so like have your babies. Like those babies are the ones that like you're going to, the other person's going to feel that passion for them mm -hmm. like you will. And if you fake it, people will tell. And in order for them to believe, you've got to believe. And so go in when you're making these calls or you're reaching out and know that, you know, go with it at a point as I have something that could help you. I have an offer. Don't be arrogant about it. Keep your emails short. Do not send any material that's unsolicited. If you are making an introduction, just ask, you know, in a couple sentences, explain why this would be of interest to them or their client. Ask to send more. Follow up. If you do make an offer, like she was talking about earlier, give it a timeline. I mean, don't say it right at the start, but if it's been two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, don't let them be I mean, in the driver's seat. I mean, if they're saying, hey, so-and-so is on set and they've been working long hours and it's not going to be for another three weeks, that's a different story. But don't be afraid to say, we really need to move forward. We're going to shoot this spring. Um, really would love to talk to your client, but can you, you know, let us know if, there, if there's interest? We really need an answer, need to know, you know, where you stand by the end of the week. So don't be afraid to, you know, take the reins there. And also, we were talking about doing your homework. You can call any of the, aid, like, first of all, go on IMDb Pro and you could see who their agents are. And I always start like an Excel database with like who the talent is, who their agent is, what the number is. And then you can call the main number at any of those agencies and check their avail. That actor may not even be available. Like if you know you have to shoot your film in 2000, like 2020, that actor might not even be available. All year. All yeah, year. I mean, so now you cross them off your list, make a note. And if the movie doesn't happen this year, go back to them next year. But it'll help you start to like weed down your list. And then you know what you're talking about and you're not calling and spending time on someone that's not available. It's not I think it's important. Available. Yeah, exactly. It does really help having a date. So I set arbitrary dates all the time, even though like I don't have my money, like I just said. Um, but, I, but I say I'm going to shoot at a certain time, like <laughs> later in the year. So you pretend that you do. And I just, I love this philosophy. It's the train is leaving the station philosophy and people start 
feeling it, and then they're going to pay attention. If you make an offer to an actor and you're like, I don't know what I'm shooting, I don't really have the money, you know, then like they're not, why in the world would they read it, right? So have your game plan, even if it's like, you know, in sand, but it, put the game plan together. And that's super important for everyone involved because you're the leaders of your project and if you don't have the answers no one else is going to have the answers and for people agents managers they're the guard dogs that allow their clients to come work with you and if they don't know who you are already with a lot of people aren't going to know who you are already um, you have to entrust them to to let them come and fly across the ocean and come shoot or you know take them to wherever you're going to go to shoot so you have to make them feel confident and comfortable and that means a really good script a really good package, a budget, partners that have done stuff. Like if you don't have the resume, partner with somebody that does, partner with them, know where you're gonna shoot, know all the logistics of where you're gonna shoot, like just really have all the answers. And that's something that you must do. And if you don't have those answers, find people that do. And that's where the partnerships come in. I think the partnerships are key and we wanna open it up for questions too. But just like one more point based yeah. on what you said is, it's also true that if you're going to get an agent's attention or you're going to go to their manager, I like to go to managers oftentimes. Managers are awesome. They're first. They care a little bit more. Agents, their job is to collect offers. This is my theory. Seriously. Their, their job is to get an offer so that they can show their clients, look how many offers I got for you today. The manager are the ones that cultivate their their careers a little bit more. They know that they don't want to play teenagers anymore. They want to start playing sexy women. Or they don't want to play, you know, the teacher role anymore. They want to play... They're managing their career, they're managing essentially. Their career and they know where they want to go. They want to start, okay, they've played all these dramatic roles. They want to try comedy now. So, like, you might hit a manager right in the way, in the, in the first off, and they're like, oh my gosh, you've got a role that's like a drama. They've never done That's exactly what they're looking for. So, like, that's... It definitely is. I always try to call the manager first. Agents I call sometimes if I already know them, but managers, really, it's, it's a great way to call them first. And actually, just call them first to kind of like see if they'll tell you a little bit. Because they might just say, Amy, don't waste your time. They're not interested in doing that. They just did that role. Yeah. And it's not even on IMDb yet or whatever. They don't even want to do yeah. something like that. And then you're just, you're, you know, you're being more streamlined in yeah. your process. Well, and, and if you have the opportunity, going back to partnering with someone that has a track record or that agents do know and that they do respect um, or so so having a partner that art can help you get in the door because there is something to be said about someone that um, has already done uh, has a relationship with the agency has already done projects that can help open that door so you know don't feel like you have to be the one to call if you can bring in a production partner I think that's really key or if you can get a casting director that is willing to help you out because they love the script and not get paid you know that's definitely someone that already has the relationships will help the process move a little bit quicker if if you're able um, to do that. It does Should help. And again, it's enrolling people. And a lot of times casting directors like producer credits do. <laughs> <laughs> she just gives away credits. <laughs> Sometimes it helps you guys. It's like if there's if they were passionate about a subject matter and they're not getting paid, it's for, it's for everyone. People might want to get involved in some other way. For me, at just at this point, just because I've made so many films, I like stuff. Um, I want stuff that, but I want stuff that's going to help the project get made. So either um, a director that's got credits that's going to help, that's going to attract talent. A director with talent attached would be even better. But the right talent, like not Joe, my neighbor, that's actually going to hurt me because I can't raise any money on Joe. But um, so those things, um, casting director, something that's going, maybe something that's got a little bit of money already attached or maybe a sales company attached. So I like some stuff around it, only if it's the right stuff. It really depends with us. Like, Or if I read a script and it just blows me away and I'm like, oh my God, I have to tell the story. So I mean... I know our company is a little weird, like our point of entry is sort of all over the place, it just depends. I also like things that have IP. So most of the projects I'm doing right now are based on either books or comic, like I said, I have a comic book company, so um, we create our own IP and we create a track record so that there's already a built-in following. That's what IP is, intellectual property, so you already have a built-in following. <coughs> That's the next panel, which I'm on this one. Um, so it just helps, right, because it's, there's stories and everyone has a story. It just helps get into the marketplace a little bit more. And that is something you guys can do too. You can reverse engineer it. Like if you've got a really cool story, um, you can 
make a book first or you get a comic book first or something like that. It just it helps to have those extra materials. Yeah. Hi, Gandhi. I'm Chris. Um, Sorry. I just wanted to find out what are some of the so um opportunity. Some of these sources of finance that have worked for you in the past that say you would keep going back to, would it be like a, a, a rich uncle or the banks or that I type of thing? Introducing to him. Um, for me, um, there are a few investors that I've gone back to. Um, we've done a lot of equity. You know, there's been most of, most of my films are equity financed in combination with maybe like a sales piece, like um, what we call the MG, like minimum guarantee on like a domestic deal in combination with equity or in combination of some sales estimates. You have a sales company that will give you some estimates and you can get someone to do a loan based on the estimates. There's a lot of different ways they cobble together, but equity is a, a lot of my films. Um, and honestly, it's kind of the same thing as I said before, is finding those people that are passionate about the story in some way or have a second reason why they want to invest in movies. We all know movie investments are not the most guaranteed way that you're going to make money, right? That's not a surprise in this room. So um, when you're pitching your investors, yes, you need to have your finance models and your budget and the rate of return and offer 15 to 20% on their money. All that stuff is absolutely important important but I like to go in trying to find that thing that's going to inspire them what's what's the other reason they want to invest in film do they want to be involved in just the arts they want to be creative and like have somewhere to go to go visit a set or meet cool creative people that a lot of times is is very valuable for the people that I work with maybe it's they want to have an EP credit like they actually want to get into the business some way and they want to learn so I've had investors come and you know have credits and they sort of follow me or they come on set and like I kind of teach them a little bit what I'm doing and it's it's really fun for them and it's that so I've had maybe three or four movies where um, a friend or girlfriend or boyfriend or something like that wants to be an actor in the movie so I would not suggest giving them the lead role unless they're really really good and you can vet them and it works but there are smaller roles in movies and it's and it's fine and you can offer those parts and that that makes that person happy and they're going to be less upset when they don't make uh, you know millions of dollars on return on their investment then that makes me happy um, I've offered someone in a credit and they gave me all free airline tickets. It was a pilot friend of mine who um, actually um, produced music as well. So I put a song in the movie and he gave me airline tickets for everyone on the movie to get to the set. Awesome. Um, there's like so many ways, right? Um, someone might have the key location, like the ranch or the house or something like that. And they want their house in the movie, or they want their ranch in the movie, they want their restaurant in the movie, and that's your key set, and you get it for free. You give them a producer credit, and they're an investor in the movie. So I always look for plan B and C. Like I always like A, of course, is you want their money, and you're going to make them money. But it's really awesome if there's a B and a C and a D and an E, and you can find as many of those as you possibly can. <laughs> yeah, the Y is other than the financing. Yeah. There's right here. Hi, my name is Jason. Um, I run an animation studio. So I guess all my questions over the next couple of days are going to have that sort of slant. Um, but I guess my question is, um, I don't know if any of you have experience in producing for animation, but I was just wondering, just curious, is whether you think the same um, value, most importantly, applies to attaching talent to animated film and not just your value, but whether you think it's a little easier to get them to voice because it's less of a commitment or, you know what I mean, less of a burden on them. Um, that, that's, that's what I'm wondering. Um, and I don't have personal, we do have an animated project that's like half in development, but I don't have experience like taking it all the way through. But I will say that, I mean, we've all sat the value that you have still of putting the actor's name on the poster and when you see the beautiful images in the animation, like for the trailer when it's playing on TV or streaming or wherever you're watching it, for them still to be able to say, starring, you know, like Robin Williams as uh, the genie in Aladdin, like there's still value to it and it still does 
sell and it still will bring in numbers um, in the international or the domestic and the international market. So I, I think that still the importance is there. Um, I, I would guess that you're going to rely even more on the, the images and the art, but I definitely think it still applies to getting um, money attached and the marketability of the film. Yeah, as much so, if even more, I would say, because you're not using their likeness, you're not using their face, but you're using their voice, and that voice recognition is huge. And it's awesome for an actor because it's less time, right? They can just do the voices. You can put them in an ADR studio. They don't have to leave their home. You can set it up at their at their home studio or whatever, and they can just do the voice and send in their voice. So, yeah. so you don't have to travel. They don't have to be away yeah. from their family. So I think that there's a lot that of incentives there to get the same caliber. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so cool. I haven't done a fully animated. Is that true? Uh, I came in and post on a fully animated film. But um, I think that um, they absolutely have, it brings so much value. And I've had a lot of my films have had animated pieces in it. And it's um, it's a great business. And I think there's there's so many... Uh, creative elements to it and just different styles and um, and like I said it is maybe a little easier to attach talent to something like that because it's a way less time they don't have to go anywhere <laughs> so I think yeah it's really an interesting place to be and you don't have to hire hair and makeup and all <laughs> oh yeah I mean yeah, they just literally can stay in their PJs in their home and put their voice out <laughs> it's great <laughs> and if it's something yeah please everything that they have said about uh, everything here would still apply to animation. That's really all I wanted to say. It's story. It's the same thing. It's story. Like they have to, you know, feel in dear. Like right now I do have like a dog movie, my first dog movie that I'm putting going out, and it's just different. Like I usually make kind of dark and sundancey indie stuff that's just like um, some of them were fun. Um, but anyway, so I have this really happy dog movie that we're taking out, and like, I'm like, ooh, who can play the voice of the dog? And it's, it's really fun, but you ha it has to be a great script, and that person, like I'm making the, I literally did the, you know, hour on the computer, what actors love dogs? I mean, who doesn't love dogs? But you know, but there's some people that are vocal about liking their dogs, and like they're in all their photos on social media and stuff. So like, you know, do that, it's the same thing same exact rules as we were just saying like why do they want to do it and why actors are you know they like their faces and their bodies in pictures so like why would they you know give their voice to something and not show their faces they have to really love it well, and if right? you're going after the actor let's just like use the dog example and this is just like just a uh, uh, it's not concrete but like in you're sending an email and you've got like three or four sentences to the actor pitching be like you know, and we, you can mention their dog, like if their dog, like um, if their dog is all over their Instagram and you know the dog's name, like just even putting in that like little personal, like, you know, we know that they love their Robo dog, Millie. Love you to play this. Yeah. yeah or like some, it whatever. makes it personal yeah. suddenly. Yeah. Um, so question? where's our next question? Right over here. Thanks. My name is Juliet. Um, I guess the same question as Jason, but in terms of short films, mm. is it worth? Say you've got a really great, strong short film. Is it worth approaching somebody who's a name actor, or, or what do you think? I think so. Yes, it's it's trickier. It's harder, but but yes, especially if your short is um, gonna be launching to make a feature. So like if it's, you know, maybe like a teaser to a series or a feature, I think so, yes. And again, it's all the same rules apply. If it's a character that's like this person's never, ever, ever played before, you have to add the incentive level double than what we've been talking about for features, basically. But also, too, I think if you're making a short film and like it's you always have to think in everything too in terms of your brand like who are you what are you putting out there and even though it's just a short film if you set a certain caliber for the work that you do and who you attach to it I think it says something when you are approaching people to do either your next short film or your next feature film so and I have several friends that have recently attached recognizable talent um, Jasmine Guy just killed it in a short film that a friend did that just premiered last week and you know, it was, 
it took one day of her life to make it. She uh, was in Atlanta. So I think the time commitment on a short film too, it's much easier to, to get somebody. Um, it let me find out if there's, a, if there's a film that does come here and is shooting, who are the actors that are in it and see if you can contact their, agent, their agency and while they're here at the end, would they be able to do like a day on your film? But you know, keep in mind, like uh, a lot of the major film festivals are qualified that your short film can qualify for the Oscars and the short film category. So, you know, doing a short film that has a named talent, same thing, it's gonna be recognized. When someone watches it, it is gonna take it up to the next level. And if you can get into, a, you know, nominated for an, a short film in the Oscars, it's only gonna help your career moving forward. So I do think you treat it exactly the same. Yeah, and it's, there's so many film festivals out there now that you know shorts introduce the features or they just have short film festivals. I mean, it's just, there's so many ways to get out there. And I would definitely recommend all your projects as you're getting them made and out there. Don't just enter the local film festival, enter the other festivals and be, be strategic on it because you know some festivals want premieres. So make sure you do your homework and, talk, and look at the ones that are the top tier festivals because they want to be first and go for it. Like people want diverse voices, different stories. It doesn't matter if you've got a great story with a great vision, enter every festival you can because that is how you're going to get out there. And a lot of times they fly you, you know, bigger festivals, they get you there. And so it's just a great way to network and get out there and, and learn and to meet people. I think it's awesome. So yes, like... Make whatever you're making, whether it's a short, a feature, a TV pilot, TV show, web series, whatever, make it the best it possibly can be with the most popular, famous, whatever you want to call it, people involved so that it gets out there. It's all about like how broad your, your, your voice is, right? You want to get it to as many people as possible. Audience, I mean, it's building your audience. And I would, yeah. I would go the same with um, documentary and unscripted. I mean, we have a real, or I guess it's a docu series right now. Our host has a huge following. I mean, she is an Olympian. She has over half a million followers on social, and you know, she's not an actor, but she has a following. And we could have done the exact same show with someone that did not have a name, but it's going to elevate the project. And companies are paying attention because, again, someone's only going to pick up a project because they're not going to make any money unless it sells. It sells seats, it's, you know, it streams, it makes money. And that means you have to get the eyes on it. And that actor is, or that actor, that influencer, the host of your show, the subject matter that you're picking to, you know, base your documentary around. Musician, and let's say it's- like anybody. There's, they, there's so many, there's so many ways. There's, there are. So I think keep it in mind, no matter what you're doing, to know that at the end, if it's gonna reach a wider, uh, wider market, that you have to have- Something. That element, and even yeah. let's say you're doing a documentary on. Um, there was the one on recently I saw on Netflix called Heal Healing, and the subject matter was was a no name because they were exploring like healing your the power of your mind on healing, and yet all the people that they interviewed were like you know Joe Dispenza and Deepak Chopra and like people that are like at the top of their game. That's a celebrity. That's the same as attaching a talent, yet in a documentary. So you really have to get the legit people. Yeah, you do. Involved. Because let's face it, like it's hard making movies, right? It's really, hard, really hard. And you're going to spend the time and energy and money regardless if you've got a person that's going to really help get it out there or not. So why not really try to get those person or people to, to attach with you to just help you? Because it's just, it's really... You know, you want to put your best foot forward, and you know, I would say you want to put your best, you know, mouth forward. Like you want as loud a voice as possible, so that it gets seen and gets heard, and so you can keep making them. I have a quick question. I'm Catherine. Um, what do you two, after you make that first call, right, to the manager or the agents or whatnot, whether you have a relationship with them or not? What do you tend to send in that first email? Is it the deck and the script? Do you go a bit more, you know? with trepidation, maybe just the deck first, and if they're interested, then you send the script. Um, how do you, yeah, how do you yes. work it? They're gonna mm. want an offer, basically. They're gonna say, make me an offer. Like, if you, if you talk to them and they're like, yeah, sounds interesting, send it to me. Send it to me means an offer. So you're making an offer, a financial offer of what you wanna pay them, or if you don't want a financial offer, you're sending them the script to read. So I always send the script and the deck, and here's a great little, another little secret for you, love letters. 
I love them. I call them the actor love letter. So I have my director, especially if you're first, second, third time, fourth time filmmaker that not everybody knows. Um, and even those people, I think, do love letters. It's the letter, personal letter from the director of why you want them to be in your movie. And make it awesome. Make it awesome. You dreamt about them for five years, even if this, you're on your 10th offer, whatever, just lie. Um, like, you dreamt about them for five years about this. When you're writing the script, they're the only person that can make it. And they did this role like this, this inspired this. Just like, make, do, don't make it 10 pages long. Make it like three paragraphs. I always make my directors do that. They hate me, but like I do it. <laughs> I think it helps because it's just, again, what's going to stand apart from the other huge things. And they might read that letter and be like, oh, it's not for me, which is whatever. You'll get a faster pass. You can move on to next. Or they might read that letter and be like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to read this tonight. I'm not going to wait till next weekend when I'm, you know, offset. I'm, I love this. I'm, I want to work with this person. Because a lot of times actors actually don't read all the scripts. They might just like it because they looked you up and they saw what you were about or who you were or short you did or just your story. Oh, my gosh, I want to support this filmmaker because I love this letter so much. Really, that happens just because they fall in love with your passion or your vision. Yeah. Well, let me think it too because that's interesting. So you said this. Do you, I what I do is I usually call and you get the assistant and then get their email address and say that you want to send something along and then so you send the email saying you know thank you it was nice to talk to you on the phone. Um, here's a little bit more information about the project and the deck. And then I usually say, we'd like to send the script. You know, let me know if I can forward the script. That's in, there's sometimes where like, I'm not getting a response on your response. And I'm just like, well, I just thought I would forward the script. So like on email three or four, I will. But I'm a little hesitant um, to send the script right away. But that's just me personally. And I use as another touch point. Hey, can I send the script? You know, I got the deck. Can, can you... We also almost always have a casting director. I, one of our tricks is we do hire a casting director early on. Um, and a lot of times I can talk the casting director into coming on um, early as we're putting it together um, and maybe pay them a little stipend and sometimes free. Sometimes. Um, and, and so that helps. So from the casting director, they just make the offer. But, and yeah. I, I, Can you just do a quick role play as if like you were calling an agent? So if someone in this room was calling an agent for the first time, can you just walk through what that conversation would sound like when you're introducing yourself on the phone, just so they know? Yeah. Yeah. Who do you want to be? I'll be the agent. <laughs> oh, darn. No, no, no. I mean, go ahead, call me. <laughs> oh. Okay. Get ready. <laughs> uh, well, no, because you wouldn't be the agent. You'd be the assistant. Okay. So I got like, hi, um, I am Sarah Elizabeth, a producer with Life Out Loud Films, and I... Please hold. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Who invited him in the room? We're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, yeah, what movie? Yeah. I'd, what I'd movie? like to... Uh, <laughs> I would like to talk to X agent and get the email address so I could forward along some information about Who a project that I'm producing. Who are you? I'm Sarah Elizabeth. I have, or Sarah Elizabeth Timmons, Life Out Loud Films. We have several projects. We worked with your client, Ellen Burstyn, on our last film. Okay. What's your name again? I'll spell it out. Sarah. Seriously. Sarah Elizabeth Timmons. Okay. He's not available right now. I'll, we'll have to get back to you. Okay. Can I just get his email address and I could put everything in writing in no, an email and that way you can look at me. it? A S S T backslash. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I will send that along to you as soon as we get off the phone. And if you could pass that along, that would be great. And I'll follow up next week. <laughs> so not fair. Seriously, you guys, that's how it is. And you just got to be like, oh, just get in there. Get that email. Because <laughs> that's all you got to get is get that email. And like then keep you, it short. Like keep it short. And if there's any legitimacy that you have, like I have a fully funded film. Like if it, that's it, get that out right away. I have a yeah. fully funded film. Absolutely. Want to make an offer. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I need the email address. Yeah, be, be succinct. I, have a, I want to make an offer to your client. Uh, we've got a film shooting in November. Um, yeah, and they'll be and like, okay. Know their name. Know, like, you know, do this uh, even if you go into a place. Like, know exactly who you need to talk to. Just don't say, I want to talk to someone about. Yeah, go know the IMDb person, know how to pronounce their, their name. Point person. Don't go to the reception and be like, I want to talk to Chris Pine's agent. No. You find out it's a Chris Andrews or whoever it is. Like, go to their actual person. Know who you're asking for. And sometimes say a two to three point agents. Do a little more back, back like really find out who the point point is. 
Do you know what I actually do? It's not that I'm thinking about this. Sometimes I act like I know them. I'm like, oh yeah, um, this is Sarah Elizabeth calling for so-and-so. And then they just kind of like assume that you know them and they might like clarify, be like, oh yeah, with Life Out Loud Films. And then if I can get in that way and do it in a tone that's like, I already know that person and always th- have that the works tone. sometimes. Yeah, no, you have to always you do always the tone. You always have to have the tone. I always do the tone because they're going to do the tone on me, so I'm going to tone them first. Because <laughs> <laughs> any doubt in your voice... Yeah, the art of the follow-up after the after the phone call. So, after the phone call and the email, right? So you you sent the assistant the the email. I I wait like a day usually, a day or so after, and just be like, hey, like if they didn't respond back, uh, maybe a day or two, I'll be like, I just want to make sure you got it. I'm trying to think. I don't. I usually do offers. So with offers, you you have an expiration date and you do it. But um, it's it's tricky. You don't want to be a pest, but you really do need to be persistent in following up. So I would say a day or two within the week you follow up. Just want to make sure you got it, and then then hold it for a beat. Um, like a week. A beat. week. That's no. yeah. A week, two weeks, right? Um, don't do it every day. They will be like, forget it. <laughs> like, um, yeah, they just they get really annoyed. I get annoyed when people bug me every day. Um, so a week, week to two weeks is the follow up. And then if you're not getting a response, then that's when I, I think I said earlier, I will follow up and say, really excited about your client. Really think they're perfect for the role. Um, I hadn't heard, just wanted to check in, hadn't heard anything. But we are on a, you know, unfortunately we're on a, a deadline. Because they're going to ask you questions, right? Then usually I get like the grill. Okay, when are you shooting? Where are you shooting? Is it financed? And that's where you go, yeah. In your voice, yeah. No. I you know, can't say do that. yes. I got. I tell the truth. Um, yeah. I also you know? well, except you for no? I didn't tell them I brought an orange. You really in their say customs. no? It's not financed. That was my only lie. You actually say no? It's not financed. Well, I usually go in, like if I'm going to talent, it's like, hey, we're 60% financed. Oh, yeah. I mean, a partial. lot of times they'll say oh, partial, partially say. financed. I never say 100% financed, unless it is. But no, I say we're I, cast contingent. That's the best. Yeah, phrase. yeah. Cast contingent. I know what all that means. I know. Okay. Well, so it, cast contingent, and but you have all the other stuff ready, right? If you're so, if you really know the other answers, like we are shooting in November in Canada or upstate New York or Trinidad, we're shooting for. 22 days we need your client for five days like if you're really emphatic on all those other answers the other part can be like yeah cast contingent well and and you know what I do too on my emails is you keep them concise but I literally put like location role like I I just do a quick overview amount of money like budget time frame and just like just a list almost like bullet points and that way they can quickly look at it and get all of how much money do you have when are you shooting you know what is the role you know what's the deadline yeah, all no, that and really I mean in all seriousness in the finance question you can say private equity because in a lot of cases that is me and they can say who and I'm like yeah right and like they laugh because no one's going to tell you who their private equity person is unless it's like you know a well known you know company that's financing really you could say private equity and that's fine um, but private equity grants and then sales you know you could, that's kind of the finance model for most people so you can say that so um, yeah we probably have questions. room for one more question but I also kind of want to because we're talking about mm-hmm. agents and we're talking at it from our side and and pitching talent do, is there did you want to I mean do you want to share anything from the agency side that perhaps you want to chime in just if I want to make sure that like if you have any piggybacks on what we've said that you think is important for them to know no, I, I think I have rudely interjected no, I, I think you have hit upon um, a lot of stuff. We do, you know, we'll often use words like it's real or it's not real in regards to projects. Right. So, you know, when we hear those buzzwords, we're like, it's not real. And so it sort of goes down to the bottom of the pile. Uh, clearly, if the project has money or you're making an offer, like legally, we have to bring it to the client. Even if it's a dollar off. Wow. Um, we have to at least let the client know that there was an offer. But often the client will give the agent the permission to pass on projects unless they meet a certain criteria. So if a project doesn't meet an actor's quote, then he can say to his agent, yeah, if it doesn't meet my quote, then you don't even need to tell me about it. If it's not good, then just pass. But if it is good, so again, so much stuff comes down to the actual project because there have been a lot of times where a project came in, the offer was ridiculous, but I read the script because there was an offer. I was like, hey, 
this script is really good. And then we look at it, and if you attach one of our people, we'll get the money. We'll get a lot of money. You know, all of a See? sudden your, you know, $500,000 movie becomes a $25 <laughs> million dollar movie. You're like, what? <laughs> So let's talk about an See, offer. Guys, that's why I'm saying okay. what I said. <laughs> so, but let's let's talk about what an offer is because if you make an offer, you have to be able to back the offer. So you have to have. That's when it's real or not real because a lot of people do make offers, but. But you're still going to read it if it's an offer. Do, well, you know, again, it's like sometimes we'll do a little bit of snooping first, and we'll ask questions or questions if we don't think it's real. We'll ask to see papers. <laughs> we'll ask to see the papers, um, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, again, everything is often about relationships, right? It's all about relationships. So if, if, if an agent already has a relationship with you and you're coming in with an offer, then they're not going to ask to see anything because they're going to believe right. you. I mean, you would hope. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's... it's it, some, some talent is very loosey-goosey about the rules. Others are very strict in regards to um, what they want their agents to do and how they want them to perform in the event of an offer coming in. I, and I think the, the thing that you said, which is dead on, there really, there's rules in this industry, but then there's not. Like, no two films are ever made the same way. No two offers are ever accepted. Like, you can't say that there's only one way to do anything in our industry. Raise money, yeah. attach talent. And you never so, know. Like, again, it's that thing. Like, you don't want to be the person that's saying no, and then that movie was the next hit thing, and that new person, that, you know, client made their debut, and now they're, like, the hottest thing ever, and that the agent said no to it because they weren't paying, they, you know, were too rude on the phone and didn't even take the offer. So there's that, there's that thing that happens in every conversation, on every project that comes in where if there's, like, that little hint of gold, I like to call it, um, the golden carrot, I call it. If there's that thing that's there, you don't want to be the person that says no, like the dummy I said no to, like the you know the hottest yeah, directors it's, on it's, the planet. You it's know, best. Like, yeah. It's best to let the talent say no. Exactly. So at least bring it to the talent's attention, let, and then let, let the, the actor, talent yeah. say no, and then he can kick himself later on. Exactly. Right. Or do your next movie. Hey, we're not in it for a one, right? We're gonna keep doing this. So like, they'll be like, "Oh man, okay, let's go again." And you remind the agent of that. Oh yeah, I'm that person that like made that movie that that your other client got really famous on or whatever. Yeah. So we need. We actually are running out of time. Can one more question, or should we wrap it? Okay, we've okay. got to move on to the next one. Um, we did share some resources. IMDb Pro. Um, look at the trades. Track your talent. Um, Track the last film you. festivals and who the hot stars are coming uh, up all around. That's yeah. those the you two guys, days after. Th there's co-directors out there too. Like sometimes maybe you get a co-directing partner and a co-producing partner. People that have track records, just bring them on. People might want to come out. Like I was like, you want to go do a you know a panel in the Caribbean? I'm like, hell yes, you know. And so like you've got yeah. gold right now. That's like just incentive enough right there. Go find a producing partner that wants to come to the Caribbean and, and develop a movie with you, or come make a movie with you, or be a part of it. Like that's awesome. Like you guys have great, like you have good incentives right now. Just just do it. Just location. do it. Really like the Caribbean, huh? yeah. Just. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, I'm going to break this up and we're going to move on to the next panel. So, is that a break? 3.30 is next panel. So, you guys want to take a 10 minute break? And we're minutes. around. So, thank you. Okay, bye.